I'm Lovett Weems from Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. My topic is Methodism's History of Rejection of General Conference Actions on Issues Other Than Homosexuality. During the debate on homosexuality since 1972, proponents of the restrictive language now in the discipline have constantly complained that the legislation is ignored or violated by many within the denomination. In response, legislation was proposed and often passed to tighten the language and increase penalties. The disobedience continued. Often the failure to obey the regulations is framed as unique to the issue of homosexuality. I knew this was not the case because I grew up in the era when churches and church leaders routinely disregarded actions of general conference regarding race. This presentation highlights some historical examples from United Methodism and its predecessor bodies when clergy, laity, bishops, and conferences rejected through their actions legislation passed by the general conference. My purpose is to show that our legacy is one of numerous examples of general conference actions that simply don't stick because of an insufficient moral base within the church's constituency. As with all rulemaking bodies, the general conference has power to act only to the extent that those actions carry with them sufficient credibility and moral authority to be accepted. When that is not the case, those in the United Methodist traditions have responded in one of several ways. The most common response has been some type of rejection, resistance, and advocacy for change. Th such defiance occurs on a continuum from statements of opposition to outright disobedience of the rule. While many of these rejections through actions are based on fundamental objections in principle, many are simply repudiation of the overreach of a centralized authority seeking more control that appears excessively intrusive. In some cases, the violations were public and recorded. In others, we can easily assume noncompliance through some combination of common sense, observation, and references in the literature complaining of violations or advocacy for more penalties to reduce breaches. Let's look first at some contemporary disciplinary mandates that are regularly ignored. When the discipline adds more and more shall language every four years, it is inevitable that examples of violations will increase. Many are ignored. While it is desirable and mandatory for every local church to have organized units of United Methodist women and United Methodist men, as well as a church school, everyone knows this is not the case. That's what you get when the preferred option to encourage something is through authority and control. However, when one claims that some of those mandatory items are truly necessary because of the doctrinal, theological, and moral consequences of disobedience, it is hard to justify selecting only one for intricate, detailed and almost tortured enforcement mechanisms. One contemporary example is rebaptism. It's interesting that the no pastor shall rebaptize prohibition is literally next to the prohibition on conducting same sex ceremonies. If we enforce both prohibitions, some annual conferences will lose far more pastors to rebaptism than to same-sex union. Let's look now at some historical examples. Women's lay rights. 
In 1888, the Kansas, Minnesota, Nebraska, Pittsburgh, and Rock River Conferences of the Methodist Episcopal Church elected women as delegates to the General Conference despite the prohibition by General Conference of such action. The five were denied seating by the General Conference. Women's clergy rights in the United Brethren Church. In the case of Louisa Clemens in 1845, the United Brethren General Conference said that the gospel did not authorize the introduction of females into the ministry. Then Charity Ophrell applied to the White River Conference for a license to preach in January 1847. The conference passed a resolution generally thought to be the first annual conference license granted to a woman in the United Brethren Church. In 1857, the General Conference became more specific by prohibiting women from being licensed to preach. Lydia Sexton had been granted the first quarterly conference license to preach in 1851 by the Iroquois Circuit in Illinois and renewed annually every year after, including after the 1857 prohibition. But she did not have an annual conference license. She appealed to a sympathetic bishop who developed a letter of recommendation to preach, carrying with it the rights of a license without using the technical term. <laughs> it was approved by the Upper Wabash Conference in 1859. Union Biblical Seminary was founded as the Seminary for the United Brethren under the control of the General Conference in 1869. Despite the General Conference actions of 1847 and 1857 limiting ordained ministry to men, when classes began in 1871, women were admitted based on the same eligibility as men with all seminary offerings available to them. The Pleasant Valley Quarterly Conference issues a license to Maggie Thompson in 1874. In 1876, her name was submitted to the Committee on Applicants of the Indiana Conference, along with the names of nine men. She was approved. She later married an Indiana minister. Twelve years later, in 1889, they moved to Illinois, occasioned by her transfer to the Central Illinois Conference. That same year, the General Conference approved the ordination of women. Within four months, the the Central Illinois Conference ordained the first woman in the United Brethren Church, Ella Niswanger, one of the first graduates of Union Biblical Seminary. Women's clergy rights in the Methodist Protestant Church. Their general conference in 1870 disapproved the ordination of women. In 1866, the North Indiana Conference had ordained Helena Davison as deacon. Davison and the North Indiana Conference ignored the 1870 action. In 1875, the Kansas Conference ordained Pauline Martindale as elder. Anna Howard Shaw, the second female graduate of Boston University School of Theology, was denied ordination by the New England Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. She was subsequently ordained by the New York Conference of the Methodist Protestant Church in 1880. In 1884, the Methodist Protestant General Conference rescinded her 1880 ordination as out of order. The annual conference ignored the action and Shaw continued to serve and be recognized by the conference. In 1889, Eugenia St. John is ordained elder by the Kansas Conference. In 1892, the Kansas Conference elected Eugenia St. John as a clergy delegate to the General Conference. The conference votes to seat women as delegates for the first time, St. John and three lay delegates. At the same General Conference, it was voted to let annual conferences decide whether to elect women to General Conference and whether women are, are, are ordained. Clergy performing marriages for divorced persons. Most United Methodist predecessor groups had similar legislation forbidding clergy to perform marriages for divorced persons with a living former spouse. In 
except for the innocent party in the case of adultery or if a divorced couple is remarrying each other. Calls for increased enforcement by bishops and increased penalties enacted indicate that pastoral situations led clergy to violate this restriction. Interestingly, in 1928, when this changed in the Methodist Episcopal Church, the position did not change, but the decision maker shifted to the pastor's decision, which made all the difference. Clergy smoking. Beginning in 1880, by action of the General Conference, those approved as clergy had to promise to abstain from the use of tobacco. In 1960, the abstinence was continued but moved from a question to be answered to a statement of the requirement before ending in 1968. In some cases, the bishops who asked the questions smoked themselves. Interestingly, the Methodist Episcopal Church South did not have a prohibition on smoking, but urged clergy to abstain. Finally, we look at three other examples. In the 1960s, some prominent white Methodist churches in Mississippi refused admittance of African Americans to worship, a practice forbidden since 1884. In 1971, Bishop Gerald Kennedy refused to appoint Faith Conklin, the first woman ordained elder in the Southern California Arizona Conference of the UMC. Bishop Kennedy, one of the most prominent bishops in the church, had a progressive reputation, especially in civil rights. However, he was not supportive of women as clergy. Instead of appointing Conklin, he put her in the supernumerary status without her request or permission. In 1980, the Western Jurisdictional Conference of the UMC elected three males as their clergy directors of the General Board of Global Ministries when the discipline required that one be a clergy woman. GBGM appealed the action to the Western Jurisdictional College of Bishops. The college upheld the Jurisdictional Conference action. The point of these illustrations is not that general conference actions are meaningless and that violations do not matter. Both are important. In some cases, the violations are inconsequential and are properly ignored. At other times, general conference actions strike at the heart of who we are and are rightfully enforced. But as history shows us, there are those times when the violations are glaring examples of tendencies to overreach and control beyond the moral consensus of large segments of the church. Legislation must rest on a broadly shared consensus that the legislation is right, necessary, and consistent with John Wesley's passion that all come to know the love of God revealed in Jesus Christ. For many, the actions of the St. Louis Special General Conference do not meet these minimum criteria of being necessary, right, and grace-filled.